may know that today has been named the National Day of Prayer. And I can't think of a better day uh, to pray. And we want to pray for those who are affected uh, with this coronavirus. And uh, as you know, now this congregation is not that old, I know. Okay, but there are people out there who are older, right? And uh, it's affecting older people in a very serious kind of way. And there are a lot of older people in our community. We want to pray, okay, about all that. And that God would open doors of ministry uh, for us uh, in, in, in this time. So would you join me as we pray together? Lord God, thank you that we can come together and worship today because we know that there are churches all over this country who just didn't feel like they could worship today. And I pray that you would bless those churches mightily. I know of one church uh, up north that has already canceled for four weeks. And uh, I pray that you bless that congregation and all those churches up north that facing such difficult days. Thank you, God, that we can meet. And thank you, God, that um, we have been given means to make our worship time a little safer. We trust you in all things, God. And I pray, Lord, that you would walk with those who are in closest contact, uh, those first responders, uh, Father, those uh, nurses, those doctors, uh, Father, the elderly, uh, for those who who run these airlines, Lord, and all of that. Lord, we pray that you would be with them. And uh, Father, we pray for your blessing. Uh, we pray for your blessing on our president and on our governor here in the state of Florida. And for all the, the leaders of Congress, Father, as they make decisions about, uh, about the next steps. And Father, we pray for your safety. And we pray as a church that uh, if there is a need, that you would open wide doors of ministry. We don't want to miss the ministry opportunity on all of this. Thank you that you allow us to minister. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We are so blessed today to have one of the true heroes of the faith, and that is Jill Shaw. Uh, Jill is here in town. You know, give her a round of applause. I'm telling you, uh, you guys know my feel on missionaries and how much I respect missionaries. And uh, Jill has been faithful to the mission movement around the world. Her dad lives up here in Sarasota, and uh, Jill was visiting this area, and we made contact with each other. We've known each other for a long time, and I said, Jill, could, could you come? And she, she wanted to come, and I said, could, could we interview you? We've got our 23rd anniversary today, and we've got a speaker for that, but could, could you Come and let's do an interview together just to introduce people uh, to your ministry and to your work. And so, Jill, thank you so much for taking the time to come and be with us even during this coronavirus, all right? Jill is missionary right now in New Zealand. And, uh, and I just read about New Zealand yesterday and the coronavirus in New Zealand, and I guess the president is... Uh, is a president, prime, is a minister. prime minister has pretty much closed down the country, it sounds like, and uh, that's something. Jill, just tell us a bit about your background, about you, and mm -hmm. all of that. Would you do that? Kia ora, everyone. <laughs> Kia ora is how you say hello in, in New Zealand, in Māori. Um, I come originally from Anderson, Indiana. I was born up there. Um, there's a few diehard fans right down here. <laughs> and that's how I met Guthrie and Barb. Um, I went to Africa, I went to Zimbabwe first in 1984, and Guthrie and I were just figuring it out today, and he reminded me it was 1986 that I met them. Now, I would have known Lee and Sherry since 1982, probably, maybe 82, 83. 
So uh, my grandparents moved down here to Venice um, years ago. And so this has been like a, you know, anytime I've been in America, I always come down here because this is like a second home because they were here so long. And as you said, my dad lives in the area. Yeah, so, right. Yeah. When Jill, uh, well, back in 1986, most of you know, of course, that I came from a New Hope Christian church in Indiana and we sort of started a New Hope denomination, okay, <laughs> since, we, since that time. But uh, uh, Jill's mother was a member of that church. Yeah. She was a, she was a faithful woman of God, and I had the privilege to, uh, to officiate over her funeral yeah. uh, several years ago. What a great, great lady uh, she was. Yeah. Uh, Jill, what's your ministry in New Zealand? Well, I've made a few notes. It's not like I don't know the answers to Guthrie's <laughs> questions, but I've made a few notes because I know your program is full today, and I want to be concise, all right? So my ministry in New Zealand basically is to announce the good news of Jesus Christ, which... Lots of times, the way we've presented the gospel in the past, it hasn't always sounded like good news. Yeah. So I try to announce the good news of Jesus Christ and connect it with people, and then connect them with a church where they'll be able to grow and thrive. Now, the problem with that in New Zealand is we don't have very many churches. Yeah. We don't have very many healthy churches. When I first got to New Zealand, um, most of the churches there were either extremely traditional or extremely Pentecostal. And you can come to know Jesus in either of those contexts. But those two contexts don't fit everybody. And so to have another church that was kind of in the middle for thinking Christians and for people who wanted a family kind of a church with children and all of that. So a church was started years ago, and my passion is discipleship. I just love doing what Jesus said in Matthew 28 and walking alongside people and helping them to, to know all the things that he taught and to obey and, you know, and to live the life that Jesus taught us to. So that's my main ministry. But let me just give you three C's to hang the ministry on. Church, campus, and community. So I work with the Shore Community Church, and I do discipleship and spiritual formation there. But I also mentor, because we're getting old, we end up mentoring <laughs> those young ones. So I mentor church planting teams in three other churches, because ministry is stinking hard. And these guys can use themselves up. You know, all of us can when we're serving the Lord. But we can use ourselves up. So I, min I minister to them. I equip them. I also try to meet regularly with the wives and just you know, help, help pour into them sure. because it's an isolated place. And then when you're yeah. starting a new church, you don't have a lot of supportive people. Right. So church, campus, and community. The church, the campus, I'm a chaplain at a university, which is just nuts when you think about the fact yeah. that New Zealand is 97% unchurched. So basically, people don't have Bibles. They've never been in a church. You say Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and they think it's a rock band or something. <laughs> and so working at a, as a chaplain at a university is just really beyond even the imagination. But what that means is, and even the whole, the whole city, it's multicultural and it's multi-faith. I will talk every day. I will be in conversations with Muslims, Buddhists, Hindu, nuns, we have students who say they're part of the Church of the Flying Spaghetti Monsters. Oh my. <laughs> you know, and I, I'm never quite sure how to make connections with that. I think they made that all up. But um, yeah, so my ministry there is church, campus, and community. Community, I work with primarily with refugee background young people. Okay. So whatever we think about refugees and, you know, the whole worldview and all of that. But the fact is, if refugees are going to be in our communities, we want to engage with those young people. We want to help them succeed in the education system. We want to help them connect, integrate, and then thrive. One, because they're all created in the image of God, no matter what their faith background is, but also so that they can be taxpayers and you know, support us as we get older and need you know, all of them to be pharmacists and everything else. Right. So church, campus, and community are basically the things that I do. What's the biggest challenge you face in your ministry there? The church. Is it? And the perception of the church. Because I live in a culture that is so secular, all of the things that, well, most of the things that people know about the church is usually what happens in the headlines. Okay. And if they have no real experience of church, they're going to hear all the bad stuff because the media often doesn't headline, you know, the good stuff that we do. And so the perception of the church is really, really negative. And at the baseline for your average New Zealander would be apathetic. 
but really there's an awful lot of antagonism okay. toward church and religion. Now today happens to be the first year anniversary of the mosque shootings in Christchurch. Oh. So last year on March 15th, 51 people were shot, mostly men, as they knelt in their Muslim prayers. That was horrible. It's tragic. It's just not how things should be. But it has opened doors for the gospel that we would never have anticipated or asked for because if you're going to acknowledge that that was wrong and that those Muslims have a right to worship, then what you're saying is that we are proponents of freedom of religion. And if there's freedom of religion for the Muslims, then there's got to be freedom of religion for us. And so we've all tried to, I mean, you don't leverage a bad thing, but we've just tried to, to acknowledge the fact that to be human is to be spiritual and faith is a good and normal thing and some of us are Christian and we can express our faith in beautiful ways too. What about the church in New Zealand in the future? How do you see that? That's one of the things that I, that I care deeply about because we don't want to just do our work and then have it fizzle. Sure. And so that's where discipleship comes in. That's also where the mentoring of these other young church planters come in. Yeah. But also growing up homegrown indigenous Maori or immigrants you know, if we, had, if we had church leaders of every flavor and color and, and original language, you know, wouldn't that just be the most amazing thing? But the church in New Zealand, um, we hope in the Lord. But if you just look at the facts and the statistics and have a ra rational, logical look at it, it's daunting. It's not yeah. a positive, this is going to be easy piece of cake kind of a thing. Right. Land is very expensive, so buying or building or whatever like that is, is just off. And sure. we don't have many people going through Bible colleges or mission or ministry training programs to think that we can staff them. Right. So even these church plants, they can plant a church, but they can't hire staff. Yeah. We, don't have, we don't have children's ministers or youth ministers. That says a lot about the church in New Zealand. Right, right, great. So. We want to pray for Jill today and for her work in New Zealand. And I want us to do that right now. And if you would join me as we pray together, let's pray. Lord God, thank you so much for Jill and for her faithfulness to ministry and for our friendship for so many years. Lord, I pray that you would bless her there in New Zealand. Help that work to prosper and to grow, Lord. Uh, help more and more people to become Christ followers and to see uh, people like Jill and the difference that Jesus makes in her life and the lives of the people that she touches there. And Father, may the church be strong in New Zealand. Uh, bless her work, O oh Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, you may be interested to know, and uh, Jill, help me with the name. Uh, I just got the name, so you don't have to even help me. Okay. But I think Jeff Vines, is that right? Yeah, Jeff he Vines. Helped start, he started the church. Yeah, he helped start the church there in New Zealand. And he is, I just saw today, is the president of the International Conference on Missions this year. That's that, in Indianapolis. Uh, in Indianapolis. Yeah. And Barb and I will be going to that. We'd love to have some of you all go to that. But uh, what a great, great thing. So yeah, Jeff started it, which is yeah. amazing. We were co colleagues and co-workers yeah. in Zimbabwe. But one of the things that's fun to announce is our entire staff now is all New Zealanders. Wow, that's it's great. It's all local. That's, and that's a measure of success. That's great. That's so. great. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Jill. Give Jill a round of applause. As we prepare our hearts uh, for taking of communion, I want to share a passage from the Gospel according to Mark. Uh, it says in the opening verses of chapter 14, after two days, it was the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. The chief priests and the scribes were looking for a treacherous way to arrest and kill him. Not during the festival, they said, or there may be rioting among the people. You probably remember Passover from uh, your Sunday school time. It was a big deal for the 
Jewish people when they were in, in Egypt in bondage, in slavery. Because as they were there in slavery, the, you remember God brought them out. Prior to that coming out, that night, they were to have the Passover feast. And the blood of the lamb was to be put in a certain way on their house so that the passing over of the death angel would not touch their family. And that, that, uh, that was the Passover. Every year, this feast was celebrated by all of the Jewish people. As a reminder, God has brought you freedom out of bondage, out of slavery. And so uh, as this time, as Jesus came to the end of his life, it says it was two days, you know, after two days, it was the Passover. And so Jesus is in this transition period in which the Passover, you remember when he told the disciples to prepare the feast in the upper room? And so on down in chapter 14, in verse 22 and following, it says, As they were eating, he took bread, blessed and broke it. He gave it to them and said, Take it. This is my body. He took the cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them. And so they all drank from it. He said to them, This is my blood that establishes the covenant. It is shed for many. I assure you, I will no longer drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it in a new way in the kingdom of God. So this is a transition for centuries and centuries, they had celebrated the Passover feast. We come to the time when Jesus is to be crucified. And this Passover is changing into the Lord's Supper, as we call it, among other things. And it was two parts. The bread that Jesus broke and the wine celebrating the blood that was shed. Jesus' death on the cross is a seal of that new covenant that changes here at this Last Supper. Instead of the, the lamb that was offered in those olden times of an animal, now the Son of God, the Lamb of God, that would forgive sin for the rest of time. They all come to this last supper. Now we call the Lord's Supper. His blood sealed that agreement, that new covenant. And we can come to God through Jesus Christ, our spotless lamb, our eternal lamb. I think it's interesting, these that wanted to kill Jesus Christ, the religious leaders, did they realize that they were killing Jesus on this Passover week? Was that a coincidence? I think not. It was God's plan, wasn't it? Was this the last Passover or was it the first Lord's Supper? And the answer is yes, it was. Don't forget as we celebrate together the, the double cup that is being passed to you that will contain both elements. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the gift of life that comes through our Lord and Savior our lamb, your lamb that was sent for our sin. And we just thank you, Lord, that we can celebrate through the ages that the end is coming, that Jesus Christ has paid the price for us. 
We bless your name. We thank you in Jesus. Amen. In Luke 21, verse 1 and 2, it gives the account of Jesus in the temple. It says, He looked up and saw the rich dropping their offerings into the temple treasury. He also saw a poor widow dropping in two coins. I tell you the truth, he said, this poor widow has put in more than all of them. For all these people have put in gifts out of their surplus. But she, out of her poverty, has put in all that she had to live on. As we uh, give back to the Lord a portion of what He has blessed us with, you know, it's, it's important that we remember it is our heart that our gifts come from. And as Jesus saw these rich pouring out large amounts of money, it, he said, was less than what the heart, that money that the, little, the widow gave that came from her heart. And so I would encourage you also to give from your heart as God is blessed. Let's pray for the offering time. Father, we thank you that you have blessed us, that you have caused us to flourish in so many ways. Use this to your glory. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, today is our 23rd anniversary as a church. Uh, we never expected our 23rd and Yeah, let's give it a round of applause. That's great. We never expected our 23rd anniversary of as a church i mean no planning was put into this idea that this would be you know right in the middle of this coronavirus thing it just wasn't it you know and and it just didn't happen uh that way but oh how god blesses oh how god blesses i i, I was thinking this morning that you know just three and a half years ago if uh, this coronavirus had come through and uh, we had had worship like today. I mean, we may have had six people here because of all of our elderly people not being able to come. So how God has blessed. One of the blessings on this church, you cannot underestimate uh, this blessing. And that is uh, Ellery and Beverly Gerard. This church started in their living room. And boy, there were times, I mean, it was a faith movement and a faith development. And I know they're so happy to see what's, uh, what's happening here. And they have been faithful through the years. About a year ago, we asked Ellery to speak. Whenever you ask Ellery to speak, it's a little bit, you know, it's a little edgy on dangerous. And <laughs> I, I don't know if you've ever heard it. It's a true story. Martin Luther, Martin Luther, great Martin Luther said he, 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 he loved the Bible, loved the whole Bible, and, but he wasn't quite sure about the book of James, okay? He said the book of James was a bit too earthy for him, okay? Well, if you know Ellery at all, you know that he is a bit earthy, okay? And, uh, but what a godly leader who's had an influence for Christ throughout Sarasota County in the life of this church. About a year ago, we had him speak at our men's prayer breakfast. And he said, I'm going to speak on this topic called. He said, this is something that really means something to me. And I'm telling you, our men sat in there. I sat in there and I thought, wow, this is fantastic stuff because I have a deep sense of call, Jill. I know you have a deep sense of call. Jacob Thomas is here somewhere. Jacob has a deep sense of call. And and Ellery spoke on that topic. And so I asked Ellery, I said, Ellery, would you, would you speak on this topic at our Founders Day uh, this year, 2020? And he agreed. Ellery, you come share with us. Give Ellery a round of applause, would you?
Thank you for being here to celebrate uh, New Hope's anniversary or Founder Sunday. Today's message is titled, Called or Chosen by God. Have you ever wondered what you would say or do if you found out you were being called by God? It seems to me that people in biblical times came up with a lot of excuses when asked to do something new, unfamiliar, or difficult for God. In the Bible, there are many examples of God calling upon people to build his kingdom here on earth. Let me name a few of these and see how they responded to God. The first will be Jeremiah. In Jeremiah chapter 4, verses 4 through 10 says, The word of the Lord saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sat you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Ah, sovereign Lord, I said, I do not know how to speak. I am only a child. But the Lord said to me, Do not say I am only a child. You must go to everyone I send you to and to say whatever I command you. Do not be afraid for th of them, for I am with you and will rescue you, declares the Lord. Then the Lord reached out his hand and touched my mouth and said to me, Now I have put my words in your mouth. See today, I appoint you over nations and kingdoms to uproot and to tear down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. In these two passages, you will notice that Jeremiah used two reasons why he could not do as the Lord commanded. In, verse, in the first verse, in verse 6, is, I do not know how to speak. And the second, in the same verse, I am only a child. I researched how old Jeremiah was when the Lord came to him, and according to the research, Jeremiah was around 17 years old. Hmm. Hmm. Have you had a discussion with a 17-year-old lately? <laughs> I have had plenty. And my experience is that they speak very well if they are asking for something they want, like going out with friends or use the family car or the family chariot in Jeremiah's time. Secondly, Jeremiah claimed to be a child. In that day and age, Jeremiah would have been a man. For some reason, I cannot see a 17-year-old having a conversation like this. Dad, I am only a child, but can I have the, car, the keys to your sports car so I can go out with my friends? Obviously, this passage is not about a teenager asking for keys to the car but it does provide some insight of how we might respond to God. Next, we will look at Jonah. Let me read Jonah chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa, where he found a ship boarded for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Now this passage I can totally relate to. When Guthrie emailed me and said, You are teaching or preaching on Founder Sunday, my first response, No, no way. Absolutely not. <laughs> then I considered Jonah's approach to be an ass to preach. All I had to do was fuel the red getaway car, flee to the border, and head for Tennessee. 
As you can see, I changed my mind, and here I am. Jonah did the same, eventually. And today, because of Jonah, we enjoy one of the world's greatest fish stories ever told. Even the whale, or the big fish, probably has told his fish friends about the big one that got away. <laughs> A third example is Hosea. Let me read chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, and then chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. The word of the Lord that came to Hosea, son of Barry, during the reigns of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, and during the reign of Jeroboam, son of Johash, king of Israel. When the Lord began to speak through Hosea, the Lord said to him, Go take to yourself an adulterous wife and children of unfaithfulness, because the land is guilty of the vilest adultery in departing from the Lord. So he married Gomer, daughter of Diblam, and she convinced, conceived and bore him a son. Can you even imagine being instructed by the Lord to go out and marry an adulterous wife and have unfaithful children? What would your parents say? Could you do the Lord's will as Hosea did? Go out and marry Gomer? Even live life through all the gossip from friends, family, and the entire town. Then, Gomer eventually leaves Hosea for another man. Hosea is free, but not for long. Seriously? The Lord then instructs Hosea, Go show your love to your wife. And I will read chapter 3. The Lord said to me, Go show your love to your wife again. Though she is loved by another, is an adulteress. Love her as the Lord loves the Israelites, though they turn to other gods and love the sacred raisin cakes. So I bought her for 15 shekels of silver and about a homer and lethic of barley. Then I told her, you are to live with me many days. You must not be a prostitute or be intimate with any man, and I will live with you. The Lord then instructs Hosea to go show your love to your wife again in chapter 3, like I just read. To make matters worse, he has to buy her back. That's in verse 2. How hard was this for Hosea? I am sure the gossip and rude comments started all over again. So, a very difficult marriage and children that are, that are really bad. Many of us would not consider this a calling, but Hosea agreed to some pretty miserable circumstances for the love of God and God's people. Can you imagine this life sentence? Would you agree to serve in such a capacity? I am sure if you did, you would be praying a lot. The fourth and fifth examples are Saul and Ananias. There are three Ananiases in the Bible. So make sure you get the right one. Let's go. I'm going to read Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 19. Meanwhile, Saul was, breath was breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked for letters to the synagogue in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, Suddenly, a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, 
and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man named Tarsus, named Saul, from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and before the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. Let's start with Saul, later to be known as Paul. When he was on his way to Damascus, the murderer of Jews, his calling began with a light from heaven flashing all around him. And he fell to the ground. After Jesus spoke to Saul, asking why he was persecuting him, Saul got up off the ground. And he was totally blind. Now that should get your attention. This is a two-part calling because the Lord, in a vision, called upon Ananias in a vision, and, as, and he simply responded to the Lord, Yes, Lord. This is the way we should all respond to the Lord's calling. But wait, there was a definitely a minute when Ananias had some concern. That was when he reminded the Lord about Saul. After speaking his concern about the dangerous and infamous Saul, who had a terrible reputation for killing Christians, the Lord's answer was still, go. Ananias was told the message he was going to give Saul. Ananias found Saul, and Saul, who was later named Paul, placed his hands on him, and Saul's sight was restored. A note, I think, that is very important is found in verse 18, where it says, He got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. And thus began Paul's journey, which led him eventually to establish and minister to churches throughout the Mediterranean basin. As you see from these five examples, there are many ways to respond when God calls. All through the scriptures, we see God calling men and women, young and old, weak and strong, people with terrible communication skills, and all other kinds of issues that might otherwise prevent them from being called to do the work of God, to spread the glorious word, and to extend the kingdom of God. Callings from God to direct communication, sometimes through burning bushes, clouds, bright lights, visions, talking with God, and even the appearance of, of angels is rare. God can work in other mysterious ways, sometimes without our immediate 
realization or knowledge that we are actually being used. How many of you have been contacted by God in a burning bush or a bright light that knocks you to the ground? Have you received a vision from God or had an, has an angel visited you at your house? I can tell you with 100% certainty that I have not seen these signs. Yet, as I look back, I truly believe that each of us can be called and used by God. As you know, today is Founder Sunday. About 23 years ago, we celebrated the beginning of New Hope Christian Church in our living room with four people in attendance. The four consisted of Beverly, Andy Simpkins, Nandy Simpkins, and me. Andy was the minister who agreed to work to plant the new church, which today is New Hope, and the body of believers is all of you who celebrate our 23rd celebration. As I said a few months, as I, I said a few months ago, Guthrie told me he wanted me to preach on Founder Sunday, which was earlier called Anniversary Sunday or Celebration Sunday with the theme of being called or chosen by God. After hours of thought and reflection on the title, Called by God, I realized that the real theme for me was God has a plan. I have learned long along the way that we have the opportunity to play a role in his plan if we only say yes. God's plan for New Hope Christian Church actually began 35 years ago. It started when I met Beverly Lawler. You see, God knew that I needed encouragement, a nudge, and a gentle shove here and there in my eventual walk with God. Two years after we met, we were married. Her mission before we were married was to get me to go to church with her to better understand God's will for our lives and for me to be baptized into Christ. As a boy, I was sprinkled in the Catholic Church. In 1986, I was, by, I was baptized into Christ by Jim Greedwood at Lake Worth Community Christian in Lake Worth, Florida. And a few months later, we were married at Rochdale Christian Church in Rochdale, Indiana. After our honeymoon, we went to a church at, Lake, church at Lake Worth with the first Sunday following our return. After service, the minister, Jim Greenwood, asked if he could talk with the two of us. The talk was about the youth program. We were asked if we would be willing to occasionally <laughs> teach Sunday school to the middle and high school students of the church. There were seven or eight students at that time. In my, if my memory ser serves me correctly, the youth director was going on vacation the following Sunday. We agreed to this only because it was be once in a while commitment. <laughs> Let's put it this way. We never saw that youth minister again. <laughs> This was our first leadership role in church, that of teaching. Our job was to make sure the kids learned the teaching of Christ and to become more familiar with the Bible. The youth group grew to many students. Truthfully, I think we learned more than the kids did. We were always encouraged by Jim Greenwood and his loving wife, Jean. We became good friends. They became our mentors. On one of our many times together, Jim spoke about our growth and about my being, and this is what he used to say, a little bit rough around the edges. <laughs> it was true. Jim said to us, one day the two of you will plant the church. That was around 1990. And I thought Jim Greenwood had literally lost his marbles. 
There was no way in a million years that was ever going to happen. During our time at Lake Worth Community Church, I would like to say I was encouraged, but I was literally talked into becoming a deacon and later an elder. This was part of God's plan to give me the tools and experiences I needed to one day start a new church. In 1991, Beverly was offered a job with Sarasota County Schools as the Director of Food and Nutrition Services. We moved immediately and started looking for a new church. We finally decided on Southside Christian Church, where Kurt Leonard was the minister. We were new to the community, still in our 30s. We knew no one. And we became good friends with Kurt and Sarah, Kurt's wife. I believe this was also part of God's plan, to put us in place for his bigger plan. You see, all during this time, God was working with others to start what would become New Hope Christian Church. There were five local ministers who attended Florida Christian College, now called Johnson Bible College. They were earning their master's degrees. My guess is that they had no idea how all this was going to fit into God's bigger plan. After completing years of studies, they were assigned a final project in order to graduate. The project. They conduct all the research, demographic studies, and develop a financial plan and an implementation plan to start five churches in southwest Florida where all the preachers lived. The intent was to serve areas where there was no Christian church so as to not take members from nearby churches. So how did Beverly and I get involved? A simple question. Kurt said to us, what are you doing tonight? <laughs> we will go out to eat after a meeting. It sounded innocent enough. <laughs> that evening, we drove with Kurt and Sarah to Fort Myers to a meeting of the Southwest Florida church planners, which was well into the discussion and planning stages of planting new churches. A decision was made that next, the next church plant would be in Nokomis, Florida. We just happened to live in Nokomis. <laughs> As the months went by and we met with the sponsoring churches a few more times, we were to the point of hiring a minister. We were asked for input since we were the ones asked to help start this ministry. Beverly thought of Andy Simpkins would be a good fit due to the way he related to the people of Rochdale Christian Church and the way he provided encouragement to her parents and family after the loss of her beloved brother David as he, in the late 70s. Important note here, Andy never knew David as he arrived soon after David's death but Andy helped the family during the healing process. We had also asked Andy to perform our wedding ceremony, but he was busy at Hanging Rock Christian Church on July 12, 1986, when we were married. Soon after, Andy went to another church in Danville, Indiana. So I never met him until he came to serve in Nokomis. When Beverly asked Andy if he was interested in moving to Florida and starting a new church, the answer was the same as it was when we asked him to perform our marriage ceremony. He was very busy with a thriving church and couldn't, help, couldn't make that type of commitment. He had a daughter in high school. No, not a good time to move. In retrospect, we heard a lot of things that made sense a child in school, a new dream house, a great congregation, and by the way, he and Nancy were happy and settled in Indiana. 
So we moved on. We were talking with a minister from Titusville area. When called, he accepted the position with the stipulation we give him three months to give the Space Coast Church time to replace him. We agreed. Then a big layoff of people who worked at the Space Center and who were members of his congregation occurred. Dave Clark asked for another six months. During that time, the second layoff at the Space Center happened, leaving even a larger number of people at the Space Coast Church unemployed. David felt called to stay and help his congregation through these tough and trying times. Meanwhile, we were back to ground zero. Using a Space Coast term, and nearly a year had gone by. After weeks later, we were to meet one evening with the Southwest Church Planners, and our mission was to identify and hire a new minister. On that very day, Andy Simpson called. Things at Danville had dramatically changed, and he might be interested in this new project. Beverly asked, him to please fax his resume as we didn't have time for the US mail. And this was before computers were commonplace. To make the story a bit shorter, Andy interviewed, the Southwest planners listened to his sermons, his background was checked, and before you know it, he was hired. The first signs of a church later known as New Hope Christian Church was beginning to sprout. All of this was a part of God's plan. I can see that clearly now. I believe our Lord Jesus Christ arranged all the pieces and put them together to make the project, this church, happen. There is no way this just could have happened by circumstance. And today, Jesus is working through his people moving more people, people or more pieces to continue the work of growing his church and bringing people to him because he loves us so much. And he loves you. You are all here today, 23 years after the beginning of New Hope. What is your story? How did Jesus affect and impact your life so you could be here today? Are you being called? Or were you called? If I asked the people who were here and helped New Hope grow, would they say they had been called or chosen? My guess is that they would probably say no. Maybe we think that moment of God talking through a burning bush or the appearance of an angel is what really takes to be called. Yet today, when I drive through the front gates and see a beautiful manicured lawn, I think, did Mike Kruger know he was being called to serve? Did the members of the music team, the worship team, know they were being called to serve? Did Guthrie and Barb know when they left St. Louis they were truly being called in God's appointed time to serve at New Hope. Do the host and members of our small groups, of the big group led by Steve Watkins to work on the landscape the last few weeks, Diane Kruger who painted pictures that are grace our church walls, did they think they were being called to serve? The elders who deal with the good parts of the congregation but also the challenges. Were they called to serve? The ladies in the kitchen who faithfully served the people who cleaned the church, Ann Worthington, who served as the church secretary for years, were they called? So many others who loved this church, who serve, who prepare and serve communion, were they called? I think we all were called. Just a few minutes ago, during our greeting time, when we smiled and shared an elbow shake, 
or a kind word, did that make a difference in someone's life that will make them want to come back to New Hope Christian Church or renew their entire faith in God's plan for them? It is likely. This could be the start of God's way of choosing or calling you. And you may have been completely unaware of the impact. Should this be a surprise? Not really. After all, we are children of a living God. We are God's chosen people. We are a part of God's bigger plan. We can be called without a miraculous experience. Just maybe God had to use more forceful tactics to get the attention of the people I cited earlier from the Bible in order for them to help build his kingdom. But we have been given Jesus as an example. His answer to God was always yes. All the way to the cross. And all the way to his victorious resurrection and ascension into heaven. As you consider your calling, let me leave you with nine characters or characteristics from the Bible and how our characters and how they responded to God's calling. This is their strategy and a strategy you can use. Pray like Nehemiah. Obey like Daniel. Lead like Moses. Serve like Martha. Fight like David. Educate like Paul. Build like Noah. And love like Jesus. And now you know the rest of the story. Each year was a different chapter in New Hope's story. Today, we start chapter 24. How will you respond to Jesus Christ's calling? Will your name be written in chapter 24 of New Hope's book? A book in God's collection of people who make up his churches that spread the word of God to the people of all nations. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ellery. You're here for a reason today. You're here for a reason. You remember that. God has his mark on your heart and your life in this beautiful story when God works. If you're here, you've never made a decision for Christ, we want you to come make that decision today. Uh, you're here, you need a church home. What a great church home this is. You come, make this your church home. Whatever the decision on your heart. Worship team, come, lead us, would you, in a song. You make your decision for Christ as we stand and as we sing.